I decided that we would step away from the discipleship direction that Glenda is moving forward in, and sharing about the aspects of discipleship, to go back to something simpler that is also a part of our walk as disciples of Christ, and that is our spiritual practices. But sometimes we think that spiritual practices are difficult or hard to get a rhythm for or make time for. So today, I'd like you to consider the practice of walking on the earth. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my life story as well. Several years ago, my lay leader and friend Sharon Rosh and I spent a week at Spiritual Summit. It was held every year at Mount Hermon, which is a spiritual retreat near Santa Cruz and Felton, California. It was a yearly gathering of many years of our lay and clergy folks, young and older, from our many California, Nevada annual conference church communities. Our dynamic speaker that year was the Reverend Mike Spotter, who some of you may know is self-described as the chief dreamer and spiritual entrepreneur of ministry marketplace innovations at Gamesburg United Methodist Church in Pitt City, Ohio. Once a tiny little wooden church in a cornfield, and now a dynamic church all over the area of Ohio. He's been there for 40 years. His story is remarkable and one you can ask me about sometime. I'd be glad to share it. But back to this story. As Mike ended his first presentation and some amazing music that first evening together. People streamed from the auditorium. Imagine a room full of people singing and listening and sharing conversations together. Some headed for an early bedtime. Others chose refreshments and then some good conversation on the porches of their cabins where many found rocking chairs waiting. A few left in search of fair trade coffee, global art, and handcrafts and books in the hospitality room. But Sharon and I decided to take a walk on the trail. The trail above the steam, stream bed, just entering into it past the chapel. Circumventing the lodges and the cabins, the trail ended up near the gymnasium that was now under construction. Since we hadn't brought our flashlight along, we knew we couldn't walk too far in the diminishing daylight. But there was a bright moon that night, so while we tripped over the branches and roots on the path, that we could still see well enough to stay on the trail. We noticed the sound of our own breathing becoming louder than the far off voices of laughter and of singing. Even though I couldn't see much of the details of the forest, I could still smell the earth in the autumn dampness, pine sap, stream bed mud, ferns mixed under fallen leaves. Before we knew it, we had been walking around and we came to the trail's end. But you know, we weren't ready to call it a night. So we turned to the left and continued on another trail. And we kept walking and noticing. And our eyes were adjusting to the darkness as it settled in. <coughs> the path led through a tunnel of trees ending with a portal that appeared to us as a dark round O in the moonlight. Inside the tunnel, neither of us could see our feet by that time much less the way ahead. So we slowed down our pace, shifting into a gear that most of us rarely use. Without sight, we relied first on sound. We realized that a couple of steps that I could hear when I got close to the branches on one side of me or on the other. I could hear how the trees muffled the sound of my breath as I drew near them, which was my cue to move a little more into the center. More than that, I could feel the presence of the trees the same way that I had been able to feel Sharon's presence 
walking slightly ahead of me. I didn't realize how well I could walk without sight. I certainly learned that night. Pretty soon we were walking more by faith and not by sight. Not just our faith in an unseen deity, but our faith in this exquisite physical fine-tuning that God had provided our bodies, minds, and spirits on the trail. Our trust and our faith allowed us to find our way in the dark without flashlights or good night vision. And when we finally reached the end of our walk, the familiar landmark of the McAfee Gymnasium, still under construction, took us by surprise. We had certainly lost all sense of time and geography. As we reached our lost lights, we wouldn't have been surprised to discover that we had been gone for a week or find that people were still streaming out of the auditorium as if we had never left. Not everyone is able to walk, but most of us can, which allows us an easily available spiritual discipline and practice that we can use daily. All it takes is the decision to walk with some awareness of who you are, of what you are actually doing, and where you're going isn't so much important. To detach the destination from the walking is, in fact, the whole point, the best way to recognize the holy that you and I pass up all the time. When someone asks us where we want to be in our lives, the last thing that occurs to us is to look down at our own feet. And when we do, to say out loud, well, I guess I want to be here, since this is where I am. The truth is borne out by the labyrinth. An ancient spiritual practice that is enjoying a renaissance these past 50 years, laid out in a perfect circle with a curling path inside it rarely comes with walls of any kind, though it might be outlined with stones out of doors, in a garden or in a meadow, or created for indoor use, painted on a canvas, or laid within. It might be made out of rope or seeds, as our youth group and I made during our annual winter 30-hour famine retreat for global hunger awareness. The important thing to note is not what the labyrinth is made out of, but to realize that the path really goes nowhere. You can spend an hour on it and end up 12 feet from where you began, walking in prayerful meditation and mindfulness. It's a spiritual experience and practice. One day, the first year I entered seminary, I met a woman who showed me the labyrinth that she had made on her land. And there it is. It was set in a small grove of pines in a quiet part of Albany, California, outside of Berkeley. It was made of found stones and rock slabs with a large oblong rock shaped like a pillow near the entrance and another in the center. When the wind blew invisible to my eyes, but not my ears, small and larger chimes rang gently overhead in the branches while pine needles sifted down to pad the area around the labyrinth. Beyond the trees, a small sparkling pond and two young horses grazed beyond the fence. I could walk her labyrinth, she said, whenever I wished to visit. She said she didn't need to know I was there. I did return one afternoon soon after and said a prayer and entered the labyrinth. And the first thing I noticed was the need for focus on the path of the labyrinth. There was no room for creativity here, no shortcuts to the center, only one path in and one path out. Practicing patience was also a ne needed necessity. <coughs> the view from the center, essentially the same as the view from the beginning, except that in 
walking in to the center. You become changed. The prize was my heightened awareness of what presence and sounds around me, slowing down and not able to focus on all the other stuff that usually goes distracting around me. Most of us predictably follow the rules, don't we? Even while browsing over them. So because I had already journeyed to the center, I sat down on that small rock, stayed a bit, and breathed in deeply the scent of the pines, and listened to the chimes quietly, randomly, making music. The music of the spheres, this is my father's world tells us. Sucking in the smell and the feel of the sun and warm stone. When I breathed out again, I noticed how good the pine needles smelled. How beautiful the chime sounded. How warm the rock was beneath my feet. And then I noticed some small mementos that Lucy and likely others had placed on the labyrinth's trail. A small cement frog, a stone flecked with sparkling mica, an emerald cross. And later on in time, a heart-shaped stone appeared. I noticed how much more I notice when I'm not preoccupied with getting somewhere or getting something done. When the path delivered me back to where it began, I paused by that large stone at the entrance again. And I remembered Jacob that night he put his head on the rock as a pillow. And he saw the angels of God climbing up and down the ladder, saying, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I agreed. Here too. The beauty of spiritual practices, friends, is like you don't need to know anything. You just begin where you are. You don't need a degree. You don't need a course. You just start. The doing teaches you what you need to learn. When I walked the labyrinth in the pine garden, I walked in my five foot six American Anglo woman's body, a particular body with a particular history, unique to anyone else's. I walked it with my own particular compulsivity, my own distinct concerns, and my longings. If I walked on a Tuesday instead of a Friday, I might have had a very different perspective. But usually I went on Fridays. I didn't have class that day. If I walked it with someone else instead of alone, I once again walked it differently. My experience changed. With so many variables available to me, I can't imagine the possibilities that might kindle in others with very different histories, different gender orientation, cultural, and generational uniquenesses, and yes, health challenges, fears and hopes, to name just a few lenses of human living. The only promise, spiritual promises, practices make is teaching those of us who engage in them what they need to know about being human, about being human with others, about being <coughs> human among all of creation, and especially being human with God. As I said earlier, not everyone is able to walk. <coughs> However, it's not calm. A Vietnamese Buddhist monk has figured out a way around it, reality. At Plum Valley, his monastic community in southern France, he teaches many forms of attentiveness, call it mindfulness, including to watch and join him. <clears throat> and join him in the practice of meditation. It's like watching a lunar eclipse. The more you stay with it, the more you notice. First, the bare heel of his foot extends
ends over the ground, coming down so slowly that it's not even a dry leaf is displaced. Then the arch of his foot begins its descent, laying itself down like a cat. And finally the toes arrive, beginning with a small one and ending with a great toe. The arrival turns into a new departure. As one heel rises, the other comes down. And up above, the body shows no sign of any effort having been made. His face is still as the moon. He is truly walking on the earth. When someone comes to Plum Valley in a wheelchair, an instructor encourages them to a comfortable place where they can sit and observe the walkers and then join in. He asks them to pick out one person who is walking. He asks them to focus intently on that person. to notice what they are doing, how they're doing it. In the meantime, the one seated pays attention to their own breathing and tries to sink it to the person who's walking. Watch the movements. Notice, he says, the exact moment as each foot leaves the ground. Notice the arch of the foot in the arrival of the toes, finding their way back down. And when distraction comes, not if, but when, the word given is, ride your breath and rhythm back to the present moment and begin walking again. <coughs> Most people discover after about 20 minutes at least two things. First, they can engage in walking meditation without leaving their seat. And second, their bodies are not as localized as they had thought. Watching intently, the observing participants sometimes lose track of <coughs> is in the air, coming down on the earth, and they become one with that person. Walking the labyrinth at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco with a group of other pilgrims from Berkeley, I remembered and shared this experience with you. <coughs> it's in the same place as their sanctuary is. On Friday nights, they practice yoga there in the evening just in candlelight there upon the labyrinth. But the rest of the time, the labyrinth is available during worship and very not worship. My eye caught sight of a man and a woman standing near the entrance, watching. After about 10 minutes, they walked together straight to the center, and they bowed their heads in prayer. Then the woman took off her shoes, and she handed them to the man who was with her, along with her purse. And as he stood watching her from the center, she took the long way out of the labyrinth, following the winding path this time. We noticed tears streaming down her face all along her walk. His tears flowed just watching her. Something was transpiring. Later, when they had regained their composure after her walk was completed, my friend and I gently went up to them to ask them about the, what had just taken place and to offer our own prayers. We sat all together nearby in some chairs. They had come to celebrate the end of the woman's many and long treatments for breast cancer. They had never even heard of a labyrinth before. And one day they walked into this cathedral she said she couldn't explain why she was drawn there that day, but when she stepped forward, her husband decided to follow and go with her. And then he decided that he would hold down the center and pray for her while she walked her way out. I began to feel at peace in my own body, she said, 
after being so very angry that my body had let me down. In walking, she had found and remembering all the people who would walk beside her through her journey. I know now why we came here this day. And I'm grateful. She said, I think it's a turning place for us both on the new journey that we are on. Solitur Ambulando wrote St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the earliest theologians of our Christian faith. It is solved by walking. What is it? If you want to find out, then you have to do your own walking. Sometimes we don't know what we know until it comes to the sole of our feet. The embrace of a tender love and the kindness of a stranger. Jesus walked a lot. The four Gospels are peppered with accounts of his walking and of those he encountered along the way. Walking gave him time to see more clearly. Like the milky eyes of a beggar by the side of the road. And the round black eyes of sparrows sitting in their cages outside the temple. At the marketplace. Because Jesus was moving slowly and deliberately, he noticed people and creatures, and they came into focus for him, just as he came into focus for them. Whether he had a destination or was headed nowhere at all, going with him was the point. Food tasted better at the place where he sat, at the pace that he took, Stories lasted longer and talk went deeper. While many of us today pay close attention to what Jesus said and what Jesus did, most of us pay less attention to the pace with which Jesus did it. We who wish to follow Jesus more nearly might decide to take more time to and see what we know, to see where God calling our attention to pay attention day by day dear Lord these things I pray to see thee more clearly to love thee more dearly to follow thee more nearly day by day